settle for the longer way. Zwei Flaschen Whisky für die Zeit. Und ich denke gern, aber du bist dabei. Mario geht fort, mal weg ist weit. Wann ich geh, wann ich geh. Ich werd die Fehler, wann ich geh. Du seh nicht mehr, was ich mach. Du seh nicht mehr, wie ich lach. Ich werd die Fehler, du wirst sehen. Hab krieg mein Zettel für den langen Weg. Du schenkst da aus mir für den Kahn. Es hat Mario und Dale ganz wunderbar. Was ich dir den weiße Dank, wann ich geh, wann ich geh. Ich werd dir fehlen, wann ich geh. Du seh nicht mehr, was ich mach. Du seh nicht mehr, wie ich lach. Ich werd dir fehlen, du wirst sehen. Well, hello, Leva Lyot. We are back live. Welcome to another edition of PA Dutch Live. We are in the month of July. Can you believe it? As an old Dutchman used to say at my hunting camp, by the year is half round already. And we, that's right. How about it? You know, I saw a couple of ads in the newspaper this week advertising Christmas in July. It'll be Christmas before you know it. But we are here live tonight, of course, like we are every month. Let me know where you are tuning in from. Throw me a comment hopefully it'll show up here in the comment section I always love to hear where the people that are viewing tonight are coming in from and we got one heck of a great episode ahead we got dr paul newman he'll be coming on here in a couple minutes to talk about freeze rebellion and if you don't know what that is well you're going to learn all about it tonight a, a, a really cool uh episode in american history that is completely surrounded with pennsylvania dutch characters so we're looking forward to paul's presentation but first i'd like to share as i do every month we start the episode Episode off with some things coming up. Uh, what can you look forward to here in the very near future in Pennsylvania Dutch related things? So as I mentioned, we got Paul Newman coming on here in a couple minutes. Uh, a couple things that I really want to share with you guys, which is really some cool information. I get people all the time that are commenting and asking me questions on my YouTube channel or on Facebook. I want to learn Pennsylvania Dutch. How can I do it? I don't want to learn it on a computer. Well, there is an opportunity for some people here if you live in and around the Lehigh Valley. Our good friends, good friends of mine, Dave and Gene Adam, uh, they live just outside of Orfield, Pennsylvania, which is right there, uh, not too far from like the McCungie area and Schnecksville and all that. They will be offering a course in Pennsylvania Dutch this fall. Here's all the information you need. It'll be Thursday evenings for 13 weeks, starting on September 9th. Each episode, yeah, each episode, each class will run from 7 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. And every uh, class will take place at Jordan Lutheran Church, which is located at 5103 Snowdrift Road in the big town of Orfield, Pennsylvania. And here's the kicker. It only costs you $15 for this class. And that's for the whole class, all 13 weeks. Uh, if you'd like more information, I've included uh, Dave's email address. It's dhadam at rcn. Dot com and also his phone number 610-395-4282 and that $15 that you're paying actually here's the little dirty secret they donate that to the church so they're just doing this out of their love of teaching Pennsylvania Dutch and all materials for the class will be provided to you you don't have to go out and buy a, a book or anything like that just show up to the class let them know that you're interested of course drop dave an email or give him a call and uh, let them know that you're interested in the class they've been doing this for years they are two top-notch people great people they're every year at the pennsylvania uh, at the kutztown folk festival every year um and they're just really really great people so if you're in that area uh, this is not a zoom or online class this is a live in-person class in the town of orfield Check out that information and give give Dave and Gene a shout. And let them know you want to join or share it with friends of yours that you know might be interested in learning from that, you know, taking that class and learning. Hey, we got a bunch of people here already uh, joining us. We got Mo Moyer joining us from Midlothian, Virginia. Did I say that right, Mo? Midlothian. We got people joining us from Lakeland, Florida. Hello, Lenore. And Kathy joining us from Elizabeth, Tan, Lancaster, Condi. Oh, Josh Miller also says they're doing a class just like this at Myerstown uh, starting in September as well. 
Josh, that's great. If you could send me the details on that class, I'll let everybody know here on my channel. Uh, for anyone that's interested and lives more in the Lancaster direction there in Myerstown, southwestern Berks County. San Diego joining us. Hi, Dave. We got Loganton, Pennsylvania. Stephen Eberly. Wow, that's the Shooker Valley up here in central Pennsylvania. And Joe is joining us from the Big Tana Shoemakersville in Berks County. Really close. I used to play Little League every once in a while in Shoemakersville, so I know that area pretty darn well. But there's Dave and Gene Adams. Check them out if you're interested in taking that class. I got some other really cool information to share with everybody. Did you know that Pennsylvania has an ice cream trail? If you ever get the chance to travel to Germany, they have all these tourist routes. There's the castle route. There's the romantic road. There's the wine road. There's all these roads that go throughout Germany that take tourists exactly where they kind of want them to go. Well, Pennsylvania has started a ice cream trail. Uh, and they highlight, uh, I don't remember how many uh, creameries, but it's it's creameries throughout the state of Pennsylvania. And you can check out more on their website if you search uh, Pennsylvania ice cream trail. I just wanted to give them a shout out because my personal favorite spot for getting ice cream in the entire Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, Wayhar Farms, just outside of Burnville, Pennsylvania on Route 183, is one of the featured creameries on the Pennsylvania ice cream trail. So check it out. Like I said, they have creameries that are in the western part of the state, in the south central part of the state, in the eastern part of the state. So no matter where you live in Pennsylvania, Probably you are within driving distance of one of these really great. And a lot of times these are mom and pop dairies. These aren't, you know, big, you know, these aren't run by Amazon or anything like that. These are, you know, and in the case of Wayhar, they're producing and growing their own milk on cows on their farm and then turning it into ice cream. So definitely, you know, check out Wayhar, of course, but check out any one of these ice cream places that are uh, these creameries that are highlighted on the ice cream trail. It gives a reason to get out and experience our beautiful Commonwealth here in Pennsylvania. I'd also like to give a shout out to the upcoming 150th Kutztown Fair taking place from the 9th to the 14th of August. Mark your calendars. Of course, can you beat a good old country fair in the middle of the summer in Pennsylvania? Great food, great entertainment. You can take your kids or your grandkids and see all the animals that are on display. So check out, and, and Kutztown does one of the best. Check them out. The biggest little fair in the state has been their slogan for a long time. So mark your calendars, August 19th through the 14th that's coming up really soon and i'm gonna shout out to another local fair there in pennsylvania dutch country and that's the Oli fair which will be taking place from september 16th 17th and 18th there in beautiful Oli, pennsylvania one of the prettiest regions in all of our state i think the Oli valley and as dutchy the cow says come to the Oli fair i agree another great opportunity to support local agriculture and all of the farmers there in the Oli valley that will be showing their animals and also supporting the places that are providing food there at the fairgrounds if you leave either the Oli fair the could town fair hungry that's your own fault that's for sure another thing to mark a calendar for we got tons of things covid must be on its way out because people are doing things again i mentioned this last month at the kutztown cultural uh, the pennsylvania german cultural heritage center kutztown university their haymet fesh which is kind of like their homecoming event will be on september 25th 2021 keep an eye on their website for more details but you at least have the date as we all know, the Kutztown Folk Festival didn't happen this year because of COVID, but they have come out with some new things and ways of doing more with the fair than just that week in July. And I'm sharing, and you can find all this on their website, Kutztown uh, festival.com i believe it is or just search kutztown folk festival but the 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 fair committee has come up with some ideas and events that they're going to be holding in the fall i have just a couple of them listed here they're going to have a farm to table dinner on the 14th of october uh they're going to have a fall uh festival so to speak on the 15th of october with square dancing on the main street in downtown kutztown how about that and then also they have a dutch hex sign bike tour that they're advertising that'll be taking place on the 16th of october all of this stuff you can find on their website just search kutztown folk festival and you'll be able to see what's coming up i'm glad that they've taken the initiative to even though they lost the fair this year because of covid and last year because of covid that the director and the the board have decided to come up with some creative ways of keeping people in touch with the festival so check all of those things out we're going to get to Freeze Rebellion here in one second, but I do want to highlight a couple other people here. Um, 
We got uh, Sunny North Carolina is joining us, originally from Lee Heighton. Well, welcome. Their name on here is What's Up Buttercup. I don't think that's their real name. Uh, Klein's Garage is asking, where am I from in Pennsylvania? Well, I was born in Reading, Pennsylvania, but I grew up just outside of Centerport uh, in north central Berks County. That's where I'm from, Berks County. And Carol Diefenbach, well, she says, our good friend, hello from beautiful downtown Burnville. I know she's a regular at Wayhar Farms, and she knows the good ice cream that is there. Without further ado, I want to shift to bringing on our guest for the evening. You know, every month I try to bring somebody on the show that we can learn from as life's all about learning and continuing our passion for learning. And, and you know, I'm always looking for ideas that are Pennsylvania Dutch related. Uh, and I'm a history nerd, as you know. I also teach high school history as well as German. Uh, and one aspect that I knew of in American history was what we're going to be talking about tonight, Freeze Rebellion. But I know that it's something that's not always taught in most high school's American history classes. So that's why I figured let's get the guy that wrote the book. So we'll be talking here with tonight with Dr. Paul Newman. Here is a copy of the cover of his book, Freeze Rebellion, The Enduring Struggle for American Revolution. I'm going to stop talking now. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to bring Paul on. Paul, hello. Welcome to PA Dutch Live. Good Abend, Doug, and good Abend, Alice. Hey, sounds good. Well, Paul, I'm going to kind of turn the microphone over to you and the show, and uh, we'll you, teach us, teach us tonight a little bit about uh, about all the great things that you learned while doing and researching Freeze Rebellion. I will, I will. Um, just by way of introduction, I am Dr. Paul Douglas Newman. I teach at the University of Pittsburgh at Johnstown. Uh, Doug asked me if I had any connection to uh, Pennsylvania Dutch uh, heritage, and I do not. I went to college in York, Pennsylvania, at York College in York County, uh, and uh, learned all about the Pennsylvania Dutch there. Had an anthropology class with a great professor who brought in Pennsylvania Dutch speakers for us, um, and we learned about Pennsylvania language, Dutch language and culture and folkways. Um, thoroughly excited me, uh, got me interested in the history of these people and began looking for a topic uh, in graduate school to write about, and I came across Freeze Rebellion. But I, that, what I didn't tell Doug uh, when we met uh, is that I have another connection. Uh, I am married to a Pennsylvania Dutch woman. Um, <laughs> I'm married into the Winters family. Uh, okay. They started out in Lancaster County in the middle of the 18th century, and in the early 19th century moved to Somerset County, uh, which is just south of us here in Johnstown. And when I first moved here, uh, I had never been to this part of southwestern Pennsylvania before, but I started exploring Somerset and I realized immediately that I was in the middle of Pennsylvania Dutch country, yeah. Western style uh, yeah. in the language, the, 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 the food ways, the barns, uh, all of that. The first thing I noticed were the barns uh, with yeah. hanging over four bays, these enormous barns with hex signs or out here, star symbols, things like that. So. Uh, so that's my connection and, and how I got interested in, in Pennsylvania Dutch history and how I continue to hold that interest. Um, so let me go ahead and bring up a slideshow and then I'll share mm -hmm. the screen. And I don't know if I can do it with my, I think I have to share first and share screen and share screen. I'll just hit share screen. Okay. And let me pull up my slideshow. And... Let's see. Is it is it sharing there, Doug? Uh, it hasn't come into the stream yet. Paul. Oh, okay. Um, How about now? I, ah, here we go. Now I there will be able to do that. Yep. Great. Now let me go ahead and pull my slideshow up and start slideshow, and we'll get started. Okay. So the first question is, um, what is this Freeze Rebellion? And just by way of just very quick introduction, right after the American Revolution, there were three movements for political democracy and to make government more democratic after the revolution. First was an incident called Shays Rebellion in 1786 in Massachusetts. Second uh, was an incident in Western Pennsylvania called the Whiskey Rebellion. And that was in uh, uh, the Pittsburgh region and surrounding area in 1791 to 94. And then five years later in 1798, 99 was the Freeze Rebellion in the Lehigh, the greater Lehigh Valley. Um, so all three of these events got hammered with the name rebellion, Shays Rebellion, Whiskey Rebellion, Freeze Rebellion, and got labeled that by the governments that these people's uh, complaints about 
uh, were directed toward. And so those governments, in order to delegitimize uh, the dissenters, labeled them as rebels um, and then used military force to put them down in Massachusetts, Western Pennsylvania, and in Eastern Pennsylvania. Um, my question is then, if this isn't a rebellion, what is it? And what this really is, was a, a movement that was part of the English political tradition called regulation. Uh, in the 17th century, uh, English people outside of political power would band themselves together in order to oppose autocratic rule and to bring about democratic changes to their government, and they called that regulating their government. This tradition came to America, and you began to see people calling themselves regulators working against colonial governments in North Carolina in, and South Carolina in the 1760s, uh, in uh, Eastern New York in the 1770s, the Green Mountain Boys, uh, the Vermont Revolution really uh, was a regulation movement. The Shays rebels called themselves regulators. Some of the whiskey rebels used that term regulators and referred to themselves when they were being called rebels, they called themselves citizens. What we see in Free's Rebellion in 1798-99, uh, these Pennsylvania Dutch men and women did not use the term regulation because it was not in their vocabulary. But what they did was textbook English political tradition regulation movement. And what it shows us is that after 50, 60, 70 years, three, four generations living in Pennsylvania, they had incorporated many of these political ideas and political traditions and sought to use them to defend themselves and their notion of democracy. So I wrote this book uh, nearly two decades ago. I began it uh, more than two decades ago in the 1990s as a graduate student. Uh, it was my dissertation. I published it with the University of Pennsylvania Press in 2004. Uh, the, the, the run of hardback long since went away. There may be some paperbacks still around. Uh, it's out of print now, uh, but you can download it for your Kindle. And I think there may still be paperback copies floating around on Amazon um, should you be looking for a doorstop or something to help you sleep at night. So uh, let's go ahead and get started with who were these people? Well, here is the only photograph of any freeze rebel or regulator um, that we have uh, to to, to show you. Uh, and this is Grandy Miller. Um, her husband, Jacob Huber, uh, was a man who was arrested uh, for his role in stopping the tax uh, that, you know, the event we call Freeze Rebellion. Um, he was taken to Philadelphia for trial. And while there, um, many of the prisoners uh, were affected by the yellow fever epidemic uh, that was running between 1798 and 1800. Uh, and he died in jail in Philadelphia. Uh, and she was left a widow. Her claim to fame, though, happened during the rebellion. Um, she and other Hausfrauen uh, would take pots of hot water uh, if you were lucky as the tax assessor, or they would take chamber pots full of last night's effluvia and dump them out the window onto the heads of tax assessors as they came to measure houses. The, the, the tax was on houses, lands, and slaves. And so this tax affected people all over the country, the federal tax. So Grandy Miller uh, was one of the Hausfrauen who, um, who took charge and, and fought with their husbands in what some people in the area called the hot water war, um, or worse. Uh, now, who are these folks? Well, that John Fries has his name attached to the rebellion. Um, and and it's, it's almost a misnomer. He was one of several leaders. He was not the leader of the rebellion. Um, but he became the poster boy in the uh, United States government's case uh, that they had against several people for the crime of treason in leading this rebellion. Um, but he was not the only one. He was simply uh, became the most famous, was given the most press. Uh, Freeze uh, was from Lower Milford, Pennsylvania in northwestern Bucks County. Uh, and uh, this is a photograph of his home. It was still standing in 2003 when I took this picture. Mm. I don't know if it's still there or not. I haven't been back there for about a decade. I'm going back actually this weekend and I'm driving <laughs> up to see if it's still there. I'm visiting a friend of mine in Schwenksville this weekend. Yeah. Um, so this is John Free's home. 
He was a, um, a vendu crier and auctioneer uh, and traveled throughout Bucks County, but also would cross county lines to offer his services uh, to homeowners who had been foreclosed upon uh, in the economic tumult of the post-revolutionary era. Um, and it was his job as a neighbor to try to get the best price he could to help his neighbors pay off their debts the best they could. Um, sometimes, of course, neighbors would come around and they would uh, have a no bid covenant, and refuse to make bids, keep anybody out who would bid to help somebody keep yeah. their home. And Freeze had to negotiate that. He uh, was uh, a German, of course, spoke German, but was bilingual, um, fluent in both languages and could deal. He could run a, uh, an auction and then head to uh, the county seat down in Doylestown or uh, uh, head over into Northampton to Easton. Uh, and, and deal with the government uh, officials in the county buildings there. Um, he was a guy who knew everybody uh, in his neighborhood, but also across county lines in this very tight tri-county region, then Northampton, Bucks, and northeastern uh, Montgomery County, but also you know, shifting over into extreme eastern Berks County. Um, and so he had a, a, an ability to be a leader, at, but as I said, he wasn't the only one. Um, the people who made up this movement were Pennsylvania Dutch men and women who were farming people. Uh, you look through this region, the Lehigh Valley region, uh, and you look at the people who were um, opposing this tax, who did it by uh, signing a petition, uh, taking part in a rally, putting up a liberty poll, and we'll talk about all these things in a minute. Um, the people who did these things, um, and ultimately sought to stop assessors from doing the assessment of the tax, uh, tended to be farming people uh, who were in their mid-30s to mid-40s. They had farms of anywhere between a, about 80 and 110 acres. So they were middling farming people. They uh, had families with about five to six children with still one or two more on the way on average. Um, they had three or four sons, uh, which they were looking to set up on their own farms. But of course, with a farm of 80 to 110 acres, uh, you can't divide that and have enough for all of your sons. And so what that means is that these people were not poor. They were not opposing a tax because they couldn't afford it. They saw this, they were living on a margin where they saw themselves as being, as having just made it. You know, maybe after two, three, four generations have really made it into this American middle class status and, and they depend upon the land that they have and making money from that land. Remember the taxes on houses and lands, um, but also slaves. None of those in eastern Pennsylvania by this time. There's some in southeastern Pennsylvania and southwestern, uh, but none up here. But at any rate, it's that land and their houses that has the value that allows them the capital to try to do something for their large families and, and to put their kids up um, for uh, the, the, their own futures, right? So the tax that comes, and I'll talk about it in a second, the tax that comes is something that um, to them portends against their future, right? So, so economically, that's the thing uh, that they've got. But economics is, is one of the low uh, um, um, issues on the totem pole for them, as you'll see. Uh, in addition to farmers, there were millers, of course, where you have grain farmers, and that's what these folks are farming. Uh, you have people that are uh, building mills and running grist mills. And millers were, of course, the center of a farmer's community. They were the local banker. You would deliver your grain there. He'd grind it up for you, store it for you, issue you credit based on what you had put in until he was able to sell it for you, right? <clears throat> so millers ended up being important people uh, in terms of, of organizing people, passing out information, and they were natural leaders, again, because they knew everybody in their neighborhood. And finally, uh, as for leadership for this, there were taverns and tavern keepers. Uh, Eastern Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Dutch country was uh, loaded with roads that were crisscrossing, uh, that were heading uh, you know, uh, you know, down to Philadelphia, uh, into New Jersey, over to New York, right out to the West. Uh, and at every single crossroads, uh, throughout this region, you'll find one of these stone taverns. You still find them today. Uh, this is the Trum Tavern in, in Trum Byersville. Um, this was the tavern of Jacob Freeze, who was John Freeze's cousin. 
Um, but there are many, many of these, and they're all still standing. Enoch Roberts Tavern that you might know in Quakertown as the Red Lion. Uh, the Comics Hotel, right? Uh, it's, it's, uh, that was Heller's Tavern. Um, and there are just many, many of these are still around and still doing the same thing they did then. People <laughs> coming to get food, to get drink, to talk about politics, uh, to talk about you know the problems of their day, things that are going on locally, right? All of this same stuff. And so tavern keepers, too. Um, were leaders in this event. Jacob Fries at his tavern would whip people up uh, uh, quite regularly about the, the direct tax that, that people were having to pay. So the other thing about these folks, these Pennsylvania Dutch, is that they were religiously um, homogenous um, in a way. <laughs> they were Lutherans and they were Reformed. Right, Dutch Reformed and Lutherans, and you know, of course, that throughout Eastern Pennsylvania, um, you know, as oftentimes as not, they join together to form uh, Union churches, right, like this one in Trumbarsville, right. Yep. Um, and so um, the Lutherans and Reformed stuck together, and the reason they did this here, because you come out here to Western Pennsylvania, like Somerset County, we don't have any Union churches. Um, we've got uh, Lutheran churches. Right. We've got Dutch reformed. Right. We've got, you know, and they separate. They, they keep themselves very, very separate. And the reason is once they got out here, they had no competition. Right. Um, in eastern Pennsylvania, they were surrounded by sectarian Germans. Right. And so and I'll talk about them in a second. So they called themselves the Kirchenleute. Right. The church people. And they, they banded themselves together. And so that's something that, that led to their identification. Um, after the American Revolution or during the revolution and afterwards, they very much identified with the Patriot cause in the Revolutionary War. Um, and, and most Kirchenleute did. So uh, one of the reasons is that, you know, for 40 years before that war, from the 1720s and 30s through the 1760s, in Pennsylvania, they were looked at as being possible fifth columnists. Um, so when the French and Indian War broke out. Uh, uh, Benjamin Franklin famously said uh, that we had to be wary of the Palatinate Boers, right, who would be uh, just as likely to join the French as they would to defend their homeland. Um, and so that, that stigma really hurt. And the reason that Franklin had that opinion of them is because the Kirchenleute, Pennsylvania Dutch people, no matter what their religion, tended to vote with the Friends, the Quakers, who ran the government in the 1740s and 50s, because the Quakers were trying to get decent land terms out of the proprietors who were seeking to uh, gobble up as much of the land and sell much of it as, you know, as they could for the highest dollar. And the Quakers were trying to develop a land office um, to sell land equitably, cheaply uh, for people like the Pennsylvania Dutch. And so they voted Quaker. And so Benjamin Franklin didn't like it. So they had kind of lived under this opprobrium for a long time. When the revolution broke out, Pennsylvania Dutch people saw Pennsylvania's revolution as one that was about giving people outside of Philadelphia, Chester, uh, and um, uh, um, uh, Bucks counties uh, an equal vote with everyone else, right? Those three counties had 24 of the 32 uh, seats in the Pennsylvania Assembly until 1776. And so the, the revolution in Pennsylvania was destroying the Pennsylvania colonial government to build a new state government that would be fair and equitable. And so, uh, you know, German citizens in Berks and, and what becomes Lebanon and Northampton counties and so forth, you know, are all about this revolution to bring themselves some democratic equality. And they fight in this revolution and they identify with it. And the people who are involved in this rebellion overwhelmingly were either veterans of the American Revolution in either the, the Pennsylvania militia or the, the Continental Army, or they were the sons and daughters of those who did. And they would again and again identify themselves in 1798 as patriots, as Whigs, right, as supporters of the American Revolution, even though it had been done uh, for 15 years by this point. Now, the reason, one of the reasons that they keep that identification so strong is that in the corner of the state, the side of the state where they are, they are surrounded by people they refer to as the Sectenleute, right? Moravians specifically, just over the river in Bethlehem, 
all around them too, people from the Society of Friends, Quakers, but then also uh, down in Montgomery County, Schwenkfelters near Schwenksville, where I'm going this weekend, um, over in Berks County, uh, various sects of Anabaptists, the farther southeast you go, the more of them you find, Amish and so forth. And so those people all were pacifists, refused to fight during the war, um, paid a heavy price for it. Pennsylvania passed a test act um, that uh, uh, forced you to take an oath to support uh, the Pennsylvania government, which, of course, uh, friends and Moravians could not do. Uh, and they paid heavy penalties for it and so forth. And so after the war, there is this competition in the Lehigh Valley between the Kirkenleute, who had served in the American Revolution, but did not hold local government office, and especially Quakers and Moravians, who did not serve in the American Revolution, but did hold all the local government offices. <laughs> right? So there, there's this, why did these guys, why are they allowed to continue in public office? We did what we were supposed to do, and, you know, and, and they wouldn't fight for their country, that kind of thing. So there's, that's the background to all what's going on. So what leads to the rebellion? What's this tax? Um, the American Revolution generated a massive amount of debt for the state of Pennsylvania, for the United States of America. Uh, the man who was tasked to deal with that debt was the first Treasury Secretary, Alexander Hamilton, under President George Washington. Um, the plan that he developed is most responsible for developing the political division into two political parties that happens in the 1790s. People who followed him and his president, George Washington, called themselves Federalists. The main opponent to this plan was Thomas Jefferson, who was the Secretary of State at this time, um, and, but also um, uh, 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 James Madison, who was in Congress and who, of course, was the principal author of the U.S. Constitution. And they began forming a following of people calling themselves Democratic Republicans. Um, what was the plan? Why did people oppose it? Here was the deal, right? The United States government emerged from the war with $75 million in debt. 11 million in foreign debt, 21 million in state debt, $42 million in uh, domestic debt. And that was the paper money and the land certificates that the government had printed to get people to serve in the war, right? Um, the proposal was to assume all of the state's debts with the national debt and the foreign debt into one national debt that would be funded, not paid off. So the plan would be to raise $5.6 million every year, right? And that would be raised from excise taxes, but also customs duties, which is taxation on foreign products coming and going in and out of American ports. Um, and so that would be the revenue. And that revenue, $4.6 million of it would pay the interest on the debt. $1 million would run the federal government. Uh, that debt would be held by a bank that Hamilton calls for the creation of in the report on public credit, a private bank that the United States government would create by putting all of its deposits into this private bank. And it was called the Bank of the United States. Now, a lot of people smell a rat in all of this. Holy cow, you're going to create a bank. You're going to create a debt for that bank. The debt will never be paid off <laughs> and the interest will just be collected for how long? forever was Hamilton's answer. Um, Hamilton's reasoning was that creditors were dangerous to the Republic and that if we, uh, if we didn't meet our obligations, we could be invaded again. We had many foreign creditors, right? But people at home could rise up against their government and the government wasn't paying, uh, their, paying its debt regularly. And by paying it forever, well, a creditor then would have the assumption or have the, the assurance that well, maybe we shouldn't attack that country if they're going to pay us forever and ever, right? So the idea was to, to create a funding system that would also provide national security. But of course, uh, people like Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, smell a rat in this, that money is going to be shifted out of the pockets of American citizens and into the hands of large bankers, land speculators, and so forth. People like 
Alexander Hamilton, George <laughs> Washington, right, who were in this business uh, of, of, of speculating in bonds, speculating in government money, speculating in federal lands, all of those things. And, and those people who were suspicious of those things were right. <laughs> so uh, by 1797, uh, George Washington has stepped down. A, a, his vice president, John Adams, has successfully won the presidency as a Federalist. Uh, running against him was uh, John Adams as a Democratic Republican who gets the second amount of electoral college votes and becomes pre vice president of the United States. Talk about a divided administration, right? Uh, here is one where uh, there, there's not a lot of love between this president and this vice president. And as soon as Adams takes the presidency, he's got a huge crisis on his hands. Um, the French Revolution had devolved into uh, bloodshed and an and incredible uh, democratic excess by 1793 and 1794. Um, by 1795, uh, the British and the French were at war with one another. Uh, in 1796, George Washington says, hey, we've got to declare neutrality and you know not let uh, ourselves get involved in a war between uh, Britain and France. But by 1797, President Adams uh, decided that, well, the United States should be able to trade with whomever it wants. We had signed a treaty with the British in 1795, Jay Treaty, uh, that uh, opened up ports to us in the West Indies, which was America's greatest trading partner for the entire 18th century. It had been shut off by the American Revolution. And so we go back to trading with the British while they're at war with the French. The French begin attacking our shipping. Um, in 1796 and 1797, uh, there are hundreds of tons of American ships that end up at the bottom of the Atlantic and the Caribbean, uh, thanks to French cruisers. So in 1790, this is Adams' first presidency, or his first uh, year in the presidency, he goes to Congress, the Federalists control the House and the Senate, and they, in the fifth Congress in 1797, propose a whole bevy of legislation to meet the crisis of what's called the quasi war. Quasi because neither country declared war, but they were fighting with each other on the high seas, um, even though there was no declaration. And so the fifth Congress passed a series of laws. Um, two of them were the alien and then the sedition acts, the alien act that would block uh, the number of people who could uh, naturalize as citizens of the United States from places like uh, Ireland, uh, but also the continent. And so that was something that Germans, you know, perked their ears up. But then the sedition law that made it illegal to uh, criticize the federal government and any of its military actions against France or criticize the president of the United States. Uh, famously, one man was, was charged and convicted of sedition for saying that uh, President Adams could kiss his arse. Um, and, and that became something illegal, as silly as it sounds. <clears throat> it's an incredible, it was probably one of the worst, next to the Sedition Act of 1917, um, one of the worst abridgments of our First Amendment that we've ever suffered. Um, secondly, a huge defense program. In 1798 alone, $10 million was appropriated for defense. From 1789 to 1798, the government had run itself on a total of $9 million. And then all of a sudden in one year, right, the, the average annual expenditure was a million for the whole government. Now it's 10 million. So it, you figure this today, you know, how many trillions of dollars do we spend on defense on every annual budget? Imagine if it was 10 times that next year and what that would look like um, for all everything else in our lives. Um, so how do you pay for these things? And, and in that defense bill, just to give a few things, uh, the Marine Corps uh, was finally actually created. I know they were born in November of 1775 at the Tun Tavern, uh, but they become uh, a, 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 a military uh, organization in 1798. Um, the Department of the Navy is created. Ports and harbors are fortified. Um, three uh, huge uh, naval ships are, are constructed, the Constitution, Constellation, so forth. Um, so massive amounts, but also the Army, um, which had been down to less than 1,000 men. The Provisional Army is raised to 50,000. Um, they also create, uh, the uh, on paper, what was called the Eventual Army. And the Eventual Army Act allowed the president to federalize 
all state militias in the event of an invasion or a domestic insurrection. So this wouldn't be something, I mean, that would come again until the Civil War, right? Um, and here is with the quasi war where it comes up. Now, how do you pay for all of this stuff? The Direct Tax Act, uh, which was a tax on land, dwelling houses, and slaves. So the U.S. Constitution uh, included the Three-Fifths Compromise, uh, which allowed southern states and northern states that still had slaves to count their slaves as three-fifths of a person for pur purposes of apportionment in the Congress. Um, but it also, that three-fifths compromise, said that slave property could be taxed if you're going to get the benefit of having your uh, your house appropriation or apportionment larger. You got to pay tax uh, on that economic value. So houses, lands, and slaves Again, in eastern Pennsylvania, it's houses and lands. The way the houses were taxed is assessors would come up and they would measure the house, right? Length and width, right? One story or two stories, right? One of the ways that was pretty easy to gauge an idea of how large and how many rooms were, because that was another thing the direct tax official had to fill out is how many rooms, is he could count the windows. And by counting the windows, he could figure out how many rooms there were. Um, and so a lot of uh, Pennsylvania Dutch people saw this counting in the window and they, they called it the window tax, right? So you may have heard of that before if you know anything about Freeze Rebellion. So here's where these people are. Um, here's Lower Milford in Northwestern uh, Bucks where John Freeze's home uh, is. Um, the, the, count, the townships of heaviest resistance were very close to one another, right? So it was uh, Lower Milford, Upper Milford, McCungy, right? Were three of the, the heaviest right? Um, it bled over into Montgomery and Berks County as well, but it crossed the Lehigh River, uh, Plainfield, Moore Township, Lehigh, Allen, Whitehall, uh, right? All of these, uh, upper and lower Saucon too, right? The five biggest were Lower Milford, Upper Milford, McCungie, Upper and Lower Saucon, right? Um, and these people, right, you look down here, you've got Quakertown down this way, uh, Quakers here, Moravians here, Schwenkfelters here, Anabaptists down here, uh, lions, tigers, and bears. Oh, my. <laughs> it's around. Okay. Uh, so how did the dissent begin to this tax? Um, well, they began with dissembling leaders. Um, people like Blair McClanahan, who was a United States congressman from Pennsylvania, who came through the region and told the Kirkenleute that if they refused to pay the tax, it might still be repealed. And what he was doing, and, and he traveled with a Pennsylvania uh, state legislature, Democratic Republican by the name of Isaac Hartzell. And so he and Hartzell went from town to town and got up on these stumps and told people, don't pay the tax, right? You know, stop the assessors. If you stop the assessment, the tax is going to be repealed. It'll be canceled. We'll also get rid of the sedition law, the Alien Act, those armies you don't like. And also, right, fighting a war with France, that was not popular with these uh, American patriots who had uh, the French as their allies in the American Revolution. So, you know, we'll get rid of all this stuff. If you just don't pay the tax, we can make it go away, um, which, of course, is not true. Telling people to break a law is not going to get that law repealed. But what they were playing on was a, uh, a provision in Pennsylvania's first constitution. We had a constitution from 1776 to 1787 in which we had one legislature, one, a single house. The legislators were elected annually. Every year you had to, to run for election. And whatever laws were passed by one legislature would not go into effect for one year's time until the new legislature came in. And a lot of Pennsylvania Dutch men and women have become used to that. And they understood that, hey, if we don't like what our legislature's done, if we rabble rouse enough, the next legislature will come in and kibosh it. Right? So that's what they were playing on. But that's not how the U.S. government works. McClanahan knows it. Hartzell knows it. Right. So they're dissembling to these people. But probably the biggest dissembler in my mind is Thomas Jefferson. So Jefferson in 1798 authors the Kentucky Resolution. He and Madison, Madison uh, authors the Virginia Resolution. Uh, the Kentucky Resolution that gets passed by the Kentucky legislature and circulated around to other states makes the argument that state governments have the right to repeal U.S. government laws, um, which Jefferson and Madison, as the author of the, of the Constitution, should know 
plainly that in a federal system that states are lesser. You can't, they don't make up, they don't have the ability to repeal federal laws. This is the beginning of what will become um, a, a program in, in the South um, to try to find ways around national federal government legislation. Um, of course, by the 1830s and the 1840s, this would be uh, the plan that's hatched in South Carolina to begin um, uh, nullifying right? The theory of nullification, federal laws, and it comes out of Thomas Jefferson. And so it's things like this that, that gave people uh, courage to do things that, that they shouldn't have had the courage to do in a lot of ways. So what did these people do to oppose uh, this federal tax and oppose all of these other things, the alien law, the sedition law, the war with France, the military buildup, all of these things, the Bank of the United States? Well, they used the Bill of Rights as a sword and a shield, um, which is really interesting. Here you've got, and this is what interested me so much about the Pennsylvania Dutch uh, and, and their uh, development as American citizens, is that in the 18th century, they began to utilize English political tradition, right, forming a, a regulation movement, but also immediately utilize the, the, the Bill of Rights and the U.S. Constitution that they had had a role in creating, right? It was Pennsylvania Dutch men. Uh, in 1787, who opposed the federal constitution when it was first read in towns like York uh, and Lancaster and Harrisburg um, and, and Carlisle, right, where some of them actually uh, uh, fired cannons uh, at people supporting the document. <laughs> and the reason they did is because it didn't contain a Bill of Rights. Here are these German people outside of the English tradition demanding what the English had created in 1689. We must have a Bill of Rights. Uh, and they get it, and then they use it, particularly in this regulation movement, the First, Second, Fifth, and Sixth Amendments. So they will assemble, they will write petitions, hundreds of them throughout the country, um, but in this region, dozens of them signed by thousands of people requesting that all of this bevy of legislation be repealed, that the war with France come to an end. They use freedom of speech and they demand their right to be heard through um, public speech, through their petitions, through assembly. Um, when they do this, they tend to use the militia to organize. They use their militia captains. When they, when they go out to demonstrate or to raise a liberty pole, as you see uh, here from the American Revolution, right? Both of these images are images of liberty poles. Uh, they use the militia to do it. They wear their militia regular uniforms. Um, they, they use regular order uh, in order to show that they are not riffraff, uh, that they are, are part of the community, that they are um, part of, of the state of Pennsylvania, um, and that they are American citizens. Um, they demand due process that is, uh, that is guaranteed by the Fifth Amendment. Um, and when they, become, when they come under arrest, and then when the federal government sends the eventual army to the region, um, they complain loudly uh, that their due process is being violated, especially as they were being dragged 60 miles away to Philadelphia for trial, which they thought was a violation of both their Fifth and Sixth Amendment rights. Uh, which guarantee local trials by a jury of your peers. Um, the thing that they stick to, that they do better than the Shays Rebellion or the Whiskey Rebellion, is they refrain from violence. You look through this whole event, and the, the opposition begins in September of 1798, um, it runs through March of 1799. There are dozens and dozens of, of instances and things that happen where violence could happen, and it doesn't. Not a single assessor was tarred or feathered or beaten. Some did have water dumped on them. Some had a little bit worse dumped on them, but nobody suffered an injury. And that was purposeful. The leaders, um, these tavern keepers, millers, uh, uh, militia captains, kept tight control over their troops to focus on political speech, raising these liberty polls, putting political slogans on them, drafting petitions, getting them signed, sending them to Washington, D.C., um, also to Philadelphia, to their state government, all of these kinds of things so that they wouldn't have an army sent to them. You see, some of these men, about 27 of the 
the the resistors who become freeze rebels um, had actually served with the uh, federalized militia that marched west to put down the whiskey rebellion and they saw with their own eyes what an army does when it marches through uh, a, a neighborhood and the last thing they wanted to do was to bring that up into the lehigh valley and so they tried to do all of this to prevent violence but also to to get rid of this all this legislation that they opposed um, so this image that's on the front cover of my book is a painting by a, an artist who uh, lives in the Saucon Valley uh, by the name of James Mann. You can see his great artwork at James Mann Art Farm. That's how I found this uh, image. And the image is, uh, is called The Confrontation, uh, and it depicts an incident on March 6, 1799, where tax assessor Everhard Folk, uh, you can't make up that name, uh, <laughs> he was a Quaker who was a tax assessor. He's also a federalist. So he's hated for three different reasons in the region. Um, he was making his way um, through um, Upper Bucks County, assessing homes and the, the Pennsylvania Dutch um, resistors got wind of it. Uh, and they caught up with him here in front of Enoch Roberts Tavern, which is today uh, the Red Lion Inn in the center of Quakertown. Um, and what happened here is they grabbed hold of his horse and they threatened him walking out of the tavern. This is a real event is John Freeze. Um, and this is how Freeze gets named as the leader of the whole incident. Um, and he gives an order to the people who stopped him. Hey, let this man down, right? Let him alone. Send him inside, right? So they bring him inside. Uh, and Freeze says to Folk, what are you doing? We warned you last week. You shouldn't come through. You're going to get hurt. You know, we can we can protect you if we have control over everyone, but you know, you've ridden into the middle of a crowd, you know, unexpected. And here I am inside. You could have gotten yourself hurt. And, you know, he and folk have this conversation. He says, look, give me your papers. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, you know, tell the people that I've got your papers while, while I'm out front talking to them and whipping them up, we're going to put you on a horse on the back, out the back door and you get out of town now. Right. And so freeze does this, Right. Uh, you know, dissolves the situation, you know, uh, you know, another round of drinks for everybody and people go home. That's March 6th. The next day on March 7th, there was word that came into Lower Milford, but also McCungie, uh, that a federal marshal had been going around arresting people uh, who had been stopping assessors. Uh, the marshal uh, and, and actually um, William Rawl from the U.S. District Attorney's Office had been around in February asking people questions, taking depositions, making lists of names. And so the marshal was up arresting people and he was taking them to a jail, a makeshift jail at the Sun Inn in Bethlehem. Uh, and so he uh, had uh, taken out some rooms upstairs and this was his jail. So we go out, arrest people, bring them back and throw them up in the jail. So word came in the evening of the 6th that this was going on. Um, some men from Upper Milford and Lower and Upper Saucon, McCungy and Lower Milford agreed to meet and decided what to do. Um, and they met in Upper Milford. And they decided that the next morning that each of them would call out their own local militia companies, that they would dress in their uniforms, that they would put uh, a liberty cockade in their hats which is a, a feather that would be dyed red, white, and blue, right? So, you know, USA, uh, also the colors of the French Revolution, right? And they were supportive of the French. And that they would march together to Bethlehem to demand the release of the prisoners, right, to get their bail. And they collected money to bail them out on the condition that the people be tried by their own people and in their own courts and not be taken to Philadelphia, right? A violation of the Sixth Amendment. So the next morning on March 7th, you see uh, people from uh, Lower Milford and Upper Milford marching together, heading there, um, and then another group from uh, Upper and Lower Saucon getting uh, into Bethlehem. By the time these guys reached Bethlehem, citizens, non-militiamen, had gathered in the streets outside of the Sun Tavern and were screaming and hollering for the race of these people, right? So you get a mob, and you've got the militia coming in. So Freeze and his men uh, and, and, and other militia captains, Freeze was a militia captain, and other militia captains got control of their own men. They tried to clear the yard of the, the mob, which they were able to do. Uh, and then Freeze took a few men and went inside. Freeze disarmed himself, um, and he told his men as he went in, we're going to negotiate with this marshal. We've got the money for the bail. We're going to bail him out. And the last thing he said to them was, for God's sake, 
don't fire unless we're fired upon first. The marshal had a posse comitatus of about a dozen armed men. Freeze took about the same number in, not wanting to take more, but not wanting to take less. They have a confrontation inside, um, uh, inside the front door. And at that point, uh, the marshal said that he could he was not authorized to release these prisoners. And Freeze said, well, we're not going to leave without them because there have been several, two hours had passed in the, in the, uh, organ, the, 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 the deliberations between them. And the people outside, meanwhile, the tavern keeper, seeing an opportunity, had been taking buckets of rum out into the crowd with cups and selling them, right, for a dime or whatever, a cup, you know. And the, so that crowd, that mob had gotten drunk. They were throwing things at the windows, throwing things at the doors, right? And Freeze had to look. He said, look, I can only control the men in uniform out there. I have no control over these other people. They're going to storm this building. And we're both in trouble. You need to let these men go, release them to me. Um, I will make sure that they're held um, and that they'll have a trial for obstructing the tax. Um, and finally, the, the, the marshal relented, having no power of the situation. They bring the prisoners out. There's a huge huzzah. Uh, and as the Moravian Journal, which uh, the Moravians at their, their, their uh, cloister there kept a journal every day of what happened in town, they, they wrote about it in about three sentences. Wow, some outsiders came into town today, got really drunk. And then some militia guy came in. They brought these people out of the jail. There was a big huzzah and they left town. Right. Very quickly, the streets were cleared. No violence, not a single shot was fired. Uh, none of that. And so the 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 regulators, our, our Pennsylvania Dutchmen, uh, believed that they had secured their object. They were you know, OK, we'll keep these guys in custody and we'll wait for further orders um, within days, um, within a couple of weeks. The next thing they heard was from the United States eventual army. Uh, John Adams uh, called out militia units from several surrounding states, from Pennsylvania itself, New Jersey, New York, Maryland, Virginia, um, and uh, they put together a force, and by early April, they marched into the region, uh, made over 100 arrests, and pulled people back to Philadelphia for trials. Um, many were charged with obstruction of process, um, uh, tax evasion, but also sedition under the sedition law and freeze and two others. Um, uh, 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 Friedrich um, uh, Getman and another man named Haney or Heinig uh, were all charged with treason, uh, put on trial in 1799, uh, found guilty and sentenced to death. Um, very quickly, however, that trial was ruled a mistrial. Uh, the judge in the trial had uh, refused to allow witnesses to uh, give uh, uh, their interpretation of events. Um, and so they had a new trial that came in 1800 that was overseen this time by a Supreme Court justice um, uh, of the United States Supreme Court. Um, all of a sudden, my mind just went completely blank. But anyway, I'll cut, it'll come back to me in a second. Um, but at any rate, second trial, this Supreme Court justice, um, he said, that the defense could not argue the, the facts or the events um, and their interpretation. And so in other words, just you know, kept them uh, from making any kind of argument that can help Freeze beat this treason rap or Getman and Haney. Um, and so they basically put their, their hands down and they, they, they didn't offer him a defense. Um, Freeze had to defend himself and question uh, the, the witnesses against him, what have you. And, and it was an absolute fiasco. Chase, uh, Samuel Chase. So Chase, for this and several other things, later uh, became the first Supreme Court justice to be impeached uh, <laughs> for his mismanagement of this trial. So, and it was it was widely reported in the papers of what was going on in this second trial. Uh, John Adams shook his head. I, I can't believe this is happening. You know, we want a nice clean trial for a nice clean hanging. Uh, but Freeze was convicted. So were the other two sentenced to death. Uh, they were to hang on the 23rd of May, 1800. Um, Adams let them sweat it out. Uh, and then at the 11th hour on the 22nd of May, issued a general pardon to freeze Getman and Haney, um, releasing them from prison and sending them home. Um, not to the rest of the rebels, <laughs> you know, not to the rest of the guys who were convicted of lesser sentences, sedition and so forth. Um, and some of these men had fines against them of up to $500. 
um, the average value of their farms of these people was about 200 to $300. So it was twice their worth. Uh, you can imagine the, 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 the horror of, of that, the economic horror that would hit. Um, so this event kind of fizzles to an end in 1800. It's like, well, what, what possible good could have come of this? Right? A lot of things, right? One of the things it did is it heavily and highly politicized these Pennsylvania Dutchmen. Um, they came out to vote in droves in 1799 and in 1800. They turned Pennsylvania from Federalist control to Democratic control. And then Pennsylvania turned the United States from Federalist control to Democratic control in 1800, brought in Thomas Jefferson, um, ran the Federalists out of power in the House and the Senate. They never regained that power. Um, and it, it started with and, and, and came through this Freeze Rebellion. It's the Pennsylvania Dutchman uh, who did this. Uh, the, the direct tax would be repealed under Jefferson's administration. Um, he would begin uh, issuing pardons to people who were convicted of, of sedition uh, and other uh, crimes. Um, and so all of this did have an effect because when Jefferson became president, the, the specter of a war with France ends and said, we sell them Louisiana, right? You know, um, you know, we go through, we, we fight a war in the uh, first part of the uh, 19th century with the Barbary pirates, the Corsairs uh, in the, in the Mediterranean. Um, but it, it's, we we're not stuck in the middle of the British and the French for a while until uh, later in that decade when they start fighting again. So a number of things um, seem to turn around. Um, and what you start to see is incredible pride. Uh, and just to go back, because uh, I didn't mention him when I put up this slide, right? Frederick Muhlenberg, right? Pennsylvania Dutchman, uh, becomes governor of the state before the end of the decade's out, right? This is the power of this movement um, to, uh, to, to, to demand democratic government, to demand inclusion in that government and to begin making democratic change in your own life, right? It was remembered for years afterward. So in 18, the election of 1840, you had um, Whigs, William Henry Harrison, running against uh, the Democrat, um, Martin Van Buren. Buren. Van Buren was running for re-election. Um, the Whig party uh, was really seen as the um, the the follower or the descendant of the Federalist Party, and so one of the local papers um, in uh, uh, the 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 Lehigh Valley published this cartoon in October of 1840, right before the election. Don't remember, don't forget the times of '99. The last time we had Federalists in power, they tried to hang three of us. Right. Don't allow the Whigs to win. Vote Democratic in 1840. Right. So so it, it didn't die. This is 40 years later. Um, John Fries passed away about 13, 14 years after the event. Um, most of the men and women who had been involved in it um, had passed away by this time. Not Grandy Miller. She lived into the 1850s, 1860s. She was nearly 100 years old when she passed away. Um, but it's still an event that's remembered. When I wrote this book uh, and published it in 2004, I went on a book tour throughout the Lehigh Valley uh, and, and made many, many, many stops at historical societies, public libraries, uh, union churches, Lutheran churches, and every single book um, signing I went to was packed. Uh, and people were there interested in this story, knew a lot about the story, were telling me things I didn't know about it. Um, it's amazing how this story has just hung on uh, and continues to hang on. So, yeah, Paul, it's such a I don't even know where to begin. You you, you a good professor. You sucked me in. I, I mean, there was, there was you, great storytelling. I think that's the thing we, we need to remember about history is that history is storytelling. Right. It is. Uh, and, uh, you know, I know from the Pennsylvania Dutch perspective um, in Pennsylvania Dutch, in our language, this is often referred to as the Hayes Spasa Ufstand, which is literally the hot water uh, yeah. re rebellion uh, yeah. and you know referencing what you mentioned already about how in some cases these the, the, the people would dump hot water on these tax assessors um, 
it, it's it's uh thank you so much for for coming on and sharing your your wealth of knowledge about this topic but as we can tell like this guy knows a lot about a lot of american history so thank you so much paul i really appreciate it if anybody out there has a question i haven't really seen any questions pop up in the chat um maybe they were all spellbound to listening to this story um can for anyone that's really interested of course i have a link to to um to paul's book in the show notes and it is available on amazon i did see it on amazon um is there any you've you've traveled in the region of course and you i mean can you visit john freeze's grave like is his tombstone still standing uh, and and you know are some of these other people that were involved are there historical markers in that region of pennsylvania that people can see oh hang on one second let me go back to share and pull my thing back up <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, sorry <laughs> so, hang on historical markers you mean like this one <laughs> <laughs> um let's see slideshow am i sharing no not yet uh um, oh, okay it's it's being fussy with me then Your okay screen so there are there are historical now. markers in in that region yeah, yeah and i'm gonna go add to stream there it is oh okay right so um back in the 40s or 50s uh, bucks county did this uh series called highways of history uh and a number of the markers that they had there's only a, a one or two left um, uh, we're about freeze rebellion and one, you okay. know, marked off John Freeze's house. Like I said, I don't know if his house is still standing. Uh, here's the barn that, that was on his property. Um, you know, in 10 acres, oh, wow. he had 10 acres of land. He wasn't a farmer, but he had cows. Uh, they had chickens, of course, and what have you. They had a, a truck garden, you know, to, to feed themselves. Yeah. Um, that kind of thing. And he had 12 kids, by the way. Remember, um, his house which I hope I'm going to see this weekend, right? There it is. Yeah. Uh, his house was 12 by 16 log house with 12 <laughs> children. I always yeah. said that, that alone would drive a reasonable man to riot. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so his grave, I, I, I'm not aware of where it is. Um, and okay. Okay. Would point it out to me. I would love to see it. Um, but you can see the Red Lion Tavern. Right. That's yeah. Still some of the there. places. Are, right. 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 And, and the Trum Tavern, the Comics Hotel, you know, these were all owned and operated. And we're, we're, we're organizing sites for this. Um, the yeah, Sun we Tavern. Can't, we can't Bethlehem. speak enough about the role of these taverns in, in especially in, well, in American history, but also in, in Pennsylvania Dutch history, because as you said, there was one at every intersection. Yeah. And they were the they were the. That's where you went. You know, there was yeah. no, that was the Facebook of the day. You sat down in the local tavern and you well, met you with the other farmers mail. around and right. Pick up your mail. You, sure, your news paper there. you got your, yeah. Right. Yeah. You, yep. you yep. met the, yep. the justice of the peace went there. That was his office. <laughs> right. Seriously. Right. That was his office. Yeah, right. There to, to settle a dispute or to force your kid to marry the, <laughs> and the girlfriend or whatever, you know, I mean, all these things happen at the tavern, you know, is the center in Pennsylvania, they were called public houses. And, and that's a particular term. Uh, when yeah. William Penn founded the colony, he wrote into the frame of government that there would be public houses in every township, that in cities, there would be one for every block. Um, and they were that important, you know, not right. just for drinking, but for all of these other public engagements. Yeah. Community engagement. Right. Yep. Right. Yep. Well, Paul, thank you so much. If anyone's interested, of course, like I said, I have a link to the to the list uh, to the book on on the show notes below. Um, you can find Paul online. He is a professor of history at Pitt Johnstown. So if you want to if you're in the greater Johnstown area, you can uh, if you want to go um, across campus. If you want to share my email address, or I can, if anybody has any questions they want to email me. Sure, absolutely. Just went ahead and put it in the chat. I don't know if you can throw it up or if it's already there. Uh, I'll put it here. Okay. okay. Yeah, I'll I'll share it with everybody here in a little bit. Um, awesome. There, I think I just took care of it. That's at least on the is. YouTube feed. There I it see. is. Yep, yep. So P Newman at pit.edu. Mm -hmm. Paul, thank you so much. Um, this is a fascinating conversation tonight. Now, you did you did the talking, but I was actively listening for sure. A great story to tell about our rich Pennsylvania Dutch history. You know, a lot of people just think all we did was was farm and and you know fought in a couple of wars, but we really we contributed a lot to the to the to the story that is America. For oh sure. yeah, absolutely. Sure. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Doug. And yep, so thank you, Paul. Yeah, Mox Good. <laughs> <laughs>
my goodness isn't it something when you have someone that knows what they are talking about what a wonderful evening having paul dr newman of course i kept calling him paul but dr newman on the show freeze rebellion is an awesome story um and hopefully that piqued your interest i think all too often in school uh you know in, in high schools in pennsylvania we learn about the revolution and and then you know, the next thing you talk about is the Civil War, and we forget about that time period in between when we won our liberty and created our country and, and when we, you know, get to our, our first major, major crisis with the Civil War. But that era of right after the revolution is filled with some amazing stories like the Whiskey Rebellion and Shays Rebellion and, and Freeze Rebellion. And, and, you know, all three of those were Pennsylvania related. So uh, maybe not Pennsylvania Dutch took place and all it took part in all of them, but it's, you know, it's on our soil, so to speak. So wonderful, wonderful stuff. Um, there's a couple of things as we do every month. That was our interview, of course, but I have every month. We always do something with the language because that's important uh, for me. Um, let me share my screen real quick. So usually I have a poem, but this month I thought it is July. You know, it's the month that in the United States we celebrate our birthday. We just got done listening to a lecture on a very important aspect of our history. So I thought, well, instead of doing uh, a poem, let's do the Pledge of Allegiance in German. Or excuse me, in Pennsylvania Dutch. Well, that was a Freudian slip there. Uh, if you go to any Pennsylvania Dutch events, like a Groundhog event or a For Summling, you will we say the Pledge of Allegiance in Pennsylvania Dutch. So here it is. I'll read it. You can follow along. Of course, I don't have the English because if you're American, you know the English to the Pledge of Allegiance to our flag. So here we go. The title, Em Versprechnis zu der Fahne, is Pledge to the Flag. Ich versprech gedreht zu sei zu der Fahne von Amerika. Und zu der Republik, zu wem sie steht, e Volk, und ich Gott, unverdehlich, mit Freiheit und Gerechtigkeit für alle. Almost word for word translation from the English right into Pennsylvania Dutch. And of course, if you don't understand Pennsylvania Dutch, like I said, you know, you know the English, so you know what I'm talking about. So there's our little dip into the language tonight. Uh, and then every month we also do some kind of song. And again, I'm going with this theme of, uh, you know, it's, it's the, it's July. It's our birthday month. And, um, so also I'll, I took myself out of the screen, but I'll put myself back in here. Another thing, whenever time you go to a Pennsylvania Dutch event, like a Groundhog Lodge meeting or a for Sumling, we almost always uh, have the Pledge of Allegiance like we just did, but we also always sing the song America. Now, again, it reminds us that the Pennsylvania Dutch, we are proud of our culture. We're proud of who we are, where we come from, but also the fact that for our entire history here in the United States, we have been Americans. And we are also proud of that. If you don't know that, just rewind and listen to Dr. Newman's whole speech tonight about an example of where Pennsylvania Dutch were proud of who we were and trying to defend what we thought were the rights laid forth in the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. So we always sing this song, uh, America, which is to the tune of, now here's where everyone gets all mad. It's to the tune of My Country Tis of Thee. To anyone outside of the United States, they hear this song and they think we're singing the, the God Save the Queen because the same it's the English national anthem because it's the same melody. This text was translated by one of the most important Pennsylvania Dutch authors in history. John Bermelin did a lot of poetry, did a lot of writing in Pennsylvania Dutch. This is his version of America. I'm just going to sing it for you. There's three verses. If you're a stringed instrument player or a musician, you see the chords there across the top. Um, again, if you know the tune, My Country Tis of Thee, this will sound familiar to you you. Bermelin's words um, really are beautiful. He says, and I'll do a real quick rough translation. My country, I sing of you. Sweet is the freedom uh, that is our freedom. I want to be here. Just like the old people, we are still doing this today. We will always stay faithful or true through all time. That's the first verse. The second verse on uh, at the at the edge of the mountains uh, above the clouds. Freedom's sound rings uh, winter in deep snow, summer when the when the fields are full of clover, you know, throughout the throughout the year. Oh, country, you are so beautiful. Freedom's song is ringing. That's the second verse. And then the third verse, uh, uh, our um, God, you led our freedom forefathers through through need with your hand um we will always stay true to you please keep our country large and free you meaning god should be our king 
protect our country. So those that's a real quick, rough translation of the song. But I'm going to sing it for you here in Pennsylvania Dutch. And if you know the tune, of course, of My Country Tizzy, you can sing along with me real quick. Here we go. My land, ich sing von dir. Sies ist die Freiheit mir. Do will ich sei. So be the old light, so feel ich auch noch heit, sind dir zu jeder Zeit immer gedrei. An felse bar ja naus, über die Wolke draus, ring Freiheit's Glang. Winders im tiefe Schnee, Sommers wans fällt mit Glee, o land wie bist du schä, kling Freiheit's Gesang. Unser Vorelder Gott, für uns in jeder Not an deiner Hand. So lang mir dir gedrei, bleib des Land groß und frei, du setch du uns König sei, schutz unserem Land. So there you go. How about that? A little bit of America for you here tonight. Now, I went through, you know, before Paul came on, before Dr. Newman came on, I went through a lot of things. Remember, we got the upcoming class for anyone that lives in and around the Orfield area of, uh, uh, I think that's Lehigh County. I'm pretty sure it's Lehigh County starting in September. Let me go back to that slide real quick so you can see it just in case anyone's interested. Starting on the 9th of September for 13 weeks every Thursday night at Jordan Lutheran Church. I also just got an email from somebody that was uh, mentioned earlier about um, Schaefer's Town is also doing classes. Um, let me see here. Uh, you're supposed to contact Alice Oscom at 717-866-5242. Um, it'll be starting in September uh, and you can register in and through August. I'll tell you what, everybody, at our September, at our September, during our August, excuse me, during our August PA Dutch Live, I'll give you more information about that class. So in case anyone's interested in that, don't forget about the ice cream trail and check out all the things with the Pennsylvania Dutch stuff involved around the Kutztown Folk Fest and what they're doing this October. One last thing before I'm out of here. Usually I don't know when our next show is going to be and who the guest is, but not this time. So mark your calendars now. The August episode of PA Dutch Live will be on the 18th at 6 p.m. And uh, our special guest next month will be Amy Strauss. Amy Strauss wrote a book a couple years ago called Pennsylvania Scrapple, A Delectable History. Now, as a good Pennsylvania Dutch person, you probably love your Scrapple. And for someone to love it so much that they'd write a whole book about it, I had to ask her to come on the show. And she agreed. So we're going to have Amy Strauss talking about all things Scrapple <laughs> and probably a little bit about Pennsylvania Dutch foods beyond Scrapple as well. On the 18th of August, just one month from now, mark your calendars. I'll, of course, keep everyone updated uh, via the YouTube channel and via Pennsylvania Dutch PA Dutch 101 on Facebook. If you're not part of that group, come on over. We have a lot of fun. We do a lot of things Pennsylvania Dutch related, of course, there. PA Dutch 101 on Facebook. It's a group. Or follow, of course, along on the YouTube channel, which I know a lot of you do. A couple things here. People um say Ellie wants to know: are any of these classes broadcast online of us? As far as I know, the Orfield one with Dave and Gene Adams is not. That is only in person. I do not know if the one in Schaeferstown is going to be virtual. My gut reaction is no. Uh, sorry to say that, but I could be wrong. Um, I know there is a lot of interest out there in people that don't live in the Pennsylvania Dutch country region uh, that want to take classes. And we're hoping that, uh, and I've been talking with a lot of people, the hope is that in the future, um, we can get some people that are willing to offer classes online to those of you out there that want to want that option with zoom. And of course, now we all have the technology to do it. We just need to find the time to do, I guess, more than anything else. So Elliot, that's the best I can tell you. Of course, anytime anything like that is going to happen, I post about it on the Facebook page. So if you're on Facebook, you won't miss, you know, if there's a class coming up, that's going to be virtual. You can bet your bottom dollar that I'll be putting it on that Facebook page to let everybody know, Hey, there's this opportunity out there. We did have a couple people joining us from Germany tonight. Thanks for staying up late. Uh, and our hearts and prayers and thoughts are all with the people of the region of Germany, where a lot of our ancestors come from the Rhineland Palatinate and the Tsarland. If you haven't been following the news this week, they had devastating, devastating floods, um, that were flash floods, well over a hundred people lost their lives 
People lost their homes, uh, lost everything in some cases. Some towns were completely destroyed. And this is where a lot of our ancestors came from, this region of Germany. So we are thinking of all of you out there that are in that region, um, your distant, distant cousins across the ocean. We are thinking of you and praying for all of you uh, that you all have a speedy recovery and, and we mourn the loss of life and we look to the ability for all of you to rebuild and, and start new. So our thoughts and prayers go out to you. We also have some people joining us from Brazil. I'm going to share this real quick. I don't know if you guys know this or not, but there is a form of Pennsylvania. That's not Pennsylvania Dutch, but there was a group of, of when, when we came to the United States, there was also a group that left Germany and went to Brazil. And in Brazil, there's this region known as the Hunsrega. And here we have a little bit of it down there. Vince, Vin, Vinicius. Hope I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name, giving us a shout out. Thanks for joining us. Um, saying maybe I should speak more Pennsylvania Dutch. They need to understand it because I can't speak any Portuguese. Sorry, but thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining us. Um, Klaus, I take it you're probably from over there. Again, our hearts and thoughts and prayers are all with you guys and, and stay strong. Um, you guys will come through. If I know anything about my German friends and, and family over there, they're tough. And they'll, th you guys will be okay. It's a little rough right now, but you guys will be okay. Well, everybody, I think that's going to be it. We ran long this month, but we had an interesting topic. Join us in one month on the 18th of August, 2021 at 6 p.m. And we'll do this all over again with Amy Strauss talking all about Scrapple. I'll have a Pennsylvania Dutch poem for you. I'll have a Pennsylvania Dutch song for you as well. And thanks for joining us. Leave comments in the section down below, of course. Engage with us on Facebook at PA Dutch 101. Doc, well, PA Dutch 101. Check out my website, PA Dutch 101.com. And we will, I look forward to being with all of you in less than a month. Take care, my dear friends. And until next time, as we always say in Pennsylvania Dutch, Mox Scoot. Ich werde dir fehlen, du wirst sehen.